Right, so um, welcome everybody and a particular welcome to uh, to Hannah, who's very kindly joined us this evening. Uh, she works for Theos, which is a, a public theology think tank, um, uh, stimulating the debate about the place of religion in society and hopefully challenging and uh, um, even more hopefully changing um, ideas through research, um, uh, uh, commentary, and events. So, Anna joined uh, Theos in 2017. She's uh, a senior researcher working on theology and economic inequality. She's the author of Growing Good, which was published in 2020, and also the report, The Torn Safety Net. Um, which was uh, published in November last year as a Theos report, and which she's going to talk about this evening. So um, with um, a, a commentary, uh, j just before I hand over to Hannah, that if you have any questions for Hannah, please put them on the chat and we'll pick them up and uh, there'll be a, a chance for a question and answer at the end. So over to you, Hannah, and thank you again for joining us. Brilliant. Thank you so much, John. And thank you so much, um, all of you, for, for having me tonight. It's great to get to, to share this research. We we do all these research projects, um, but actually the joy is getting to go and, and share the findings with people. So, yeah. Um, so I'm here tonight to talk about this report, um, A Torn Safety Net, and the subtitle was How the Cost of Living Crisis is Threatening Its Own um, Last Line of Defence. And to provide a little bit of context for that, when we um, started kind of scoping this out as a research project about 18 months ago, um, the cost of living crisis as a phrase wasn't really a phrase. Um, it was something that was maybe beginning. Uh, some of the effects were starting to be seen, if you kind of think back to this time last year and a little bit longer ago than that. Um, but it certainly wasn't full blown and it certainly wasn't as um, common a use in, in our vocabulary is, is now I noticed recently that the cost of living crisis has its own um, heading on the BBC website it has its own correspondent in a lot of um, kind of media outlets now um, so it's really grown and so we set out to explore um, not the cost of living crisis because there was not one um, but economic insecurity as a slightly vaguer slightly broader um, term and how that was affecting faith groups or how it related to, to faith groups and to, to charities um, and for a collection of reasons that you will all know both um, geopolitical and domestic our kind of our whole econ uh, economic life our whole economy I guess became less secure um, in the course of the project and and so the, the focus of the project kind of evolved to, to reflect that um, by the time the research began the economy was less stable than when we'd kind of agreed it as a research topic and, and so on and so forth in the course of last year um, and so the, the, the kind of conclusion that we came to was that as um, individual circumstances were becoming less and less secure and um, the role of faith groups and local charities as anchors for the community um, was becoming more and more important and um, that much was fairly evident um, but actually that you know that's a really good thing that they're able to, to provide that um, but we also saw how the cost of living crisis increasingly was was affecting whole organizations um, and institutions not just individuals or households um, or kind of families but actually those charities and those organizations that are the safety net were the, in turn themselves experiencing the effect of um of the cost of living crisis and so that's kind of where we landed with the findings um, and I apologise in advance that some of it isn't necessarily the most cheerful um, content. There is there's a lot of hope in there as well. I think in terms of seeing what organisations are doing, um, but a lot of it is quite quite bleak in terms of the outlook for organisations. But we found that some of the value of the research actually has been in documenting that, um, in pulling together that evidence that individual churches and charities that feel like they're struggling aren't by any stretch alone in that um, and there's something quite hopeful I think in, in being able to tell that as a collective story um, even if it is a kind of combination of less less good stories maybe. So the findings draw just briefly on um, 48 interviews that we did over the course of last year um, with a collection of faith leaders, um, charity leaders, volunteers, community members, local councillors, a whole breadth of different um, local individuals in 
uh, four local authority areas in England and Scotland, and there were a few in other places, but they kind of focused in those areas. Um, and they represented both charities and um, faith communities from 12 different Christian denominations um, and non-denominational groups, as well as Muslim, Buddhist um, and Jewish participants, and some of no faith. Um, and when we wrote this all up, I was really conscious that kind of uh, some of the interviews from like January and February last year seem kind of almost naive compared to some of the ones from in sort of March and June time. Um, there are plenty of quotes in the report, for example, where even without the date, um, I, I think I'd be able to tell you when in the year they took place just based on kind of how optimistic or positive or negative they were about the outlook. Um, and we're now in the process of revisiting some of the people that we interviewed and some of the context to see how the winter's been. Um, because we're really conscious that this was published in November last year and actually even November till now in this kind of scale of the economy is, is quite a long time. Um, so we're going back and seeing how things have been since we published. Um, and so just before I turn to the, the findings in terms of the actual kind of cost of living crisis and the safety net, I'll begin with the question that we began all of our interviews with. What is economic insecurity? Um, or what does it mean for your community, for your church, for your um, context today? This is the technical definition. This is from the RSA. Um, the degree of confidence that a person can have in maintaining a decent quality of life um, now and in the future. And I think this one applies actually not only at a personal level, but also at a kind of organisational or sectoral level as well. You can substitute um, charity or congregation for, for person in that definition. You could replace um, quality of life with um, quality or maybe quantity of service um, or presence in the community or whatever the metric is that's most um, valuable for you or most applicable for you. But the sense is as valid. Um, and something that we heard throughout the research was how important the, the future aspect of that also was, particularly when the economy is changing, um, inflation rising as fast or kind of changing as fast as it has been in the last year, um, that sense of things not just being um, difficult, but being quite volatile and looking ahead to the future being quite a difficult thing um, was certainly there. There was certainly a sense, for example, that even if you could afford uh, the increase in energy bills the first time they went up, that wasn't a guarantee that the next time they went up, you also would be able to. Um, and so actually being comfortable today wasn't a guarantee that six months down the line, you wouldn't also be experiencing insecurity. So that was the te technical definition, um, but this is the one that I can quote by heart or that I remember when I'm thinking about this, this research. Economic insecurity is existence in the 21st century in this area. Um, and that was a quote from a, from a vicar this time called May last year, just kind of setting the scene for the fact that actually in that community, the cost of living crisis wasn't new, that yes, it had deepened uh, what was already being experienced, but that, that kind of concept of things feeling fairly insecure, wasn't by any stretch um, new. And the image that came to mind here was one of these um, arcade coin pusher games. I got a picture because I didn't know the word, but I'm told recently that they're called Penny Waterfalls. Um, I didn't know that one, but that sense that for quite a long time, people um, and indeed communities have been on the edge of this, just kind of sliding back and forwards, fairly precarious, um, but, but actually secure enough. And as you'll know, if you've ever played these games, you can go for quite a long time, actually. It can be quite frustrating, the things going back and forth before they fall off. Um, but also when they do, it's not just one that goes, it's all of them. Um, and obviously where that analogy doesn't work is that in this example, when they all fall off the edge, it's not jackpot. It's completely the opposite. Um, but that sense that communities have been kind of hanging on on the edge for a while and, and the events of the last, well, the last year, but coming on the back of the pandemic have kind of kicked things over the edge. And so I'll run through these five um, elements of insecurity just briefly. These were the kind of particular aspects of it that people picked up on when we asked them to define insecurity, when we asked what it kind of looked like in that context. Um, and all of these have been deepened, worsened, changed by the pandemic, by the cost of living crisis in different ways. Um, and they also, I think, get to the heart of why insecurity is so utterly different from um, poverty or need or deprivation or any of the other words that we use, I guess, in this or can use in this context, that it's it's much more wide reaching. Um, but it's also a kind of has an emotional edge as well, that that feeling of insecurity is actually a lot more tangible than the kind of it's harder to apply a figure to, to insecurity than it is to, to poverty, for example. Um, but that sense of it affecting people. And I think that's why 
particularly with the cost of living crisis, we've, we've all experienced that sense of it affecting far broader um, a range of people than kind of previous examples. Um, so the first one is, is finance and, and income insecurity. Um, and there are layers of this because if your income is insecure for whatever reason, if you don't know how much money is coming in this month, um, then the forms of finance you have access to are slimmer and riskier. If you've got no savings, for example, that's in itself a form of insecurity because you've got less things to fall back on. Um, and where things are really biting here is that there are fewer and kind of fewer and fewer options really for people in this sense. So um, one debt advisor that we interviewed talked about how their first port of call when someone came to them in problem debt or in kind of insecure financial circumstances, the first thing they always used to do um, would be to negotiate them a better energy deal. Um, and we all know that in this climate, that's simply not possible. Um, and so that's kind of, there's, there's just less and less places to turn, I guess. Um, job insecurity and security of, of work is a significant one as well. Um, there's been kind of changes to, to the labour market to, to work in the last few years with the rise of the gig economy, making a lot of jobs a lot less secure than they than they might have been. Um, there's also differentials in terms of who was able to go on furlough and who wasn't and how that kind of either you lost your job or you went on furlough and obviously that has implications. Um, but there's also a double whammy because the, in, the industries that are in which jobs are least secure themselves um, and often the lowest paid are also the industries that are as a whole less secure in this climate. So if you think for a minute about how many times the idea of um, cutting back on takeaways has been floated as a way in which the, the economic crisis is affecting people even in much higher income groups to go out for dinner less or get less takeaways. Um, then you think about the trickle down instability that leads to in people that work in the takeaway industry where that's as delivery drivers or in, in in the restaurants themselves and it quickly becomes apparent that this is um yeah affecting a lot of people through work housing um was a really interesting one that that people brought up again and it's quite cross-cutting i think because we we saw during the pandemic a rise in no fault evictions um in landlords kind of for whatever reason selling properties or kicking tenants out um and that is quite cross-cutting across economic class across kind of demographics because um, you can be a young professional privately renting on a fairly decent income but if you're privately renting then you can still be served with a no-fault eviction and your housing is only as secure as your landlord's kind of intentions um, and that's true also for kind of lower level lower paid people in the private rented sector and to some extent social housing as well um, and as that quote shows that instability of of housing affects people's ability to to belong um, or to commit. So if you're not sure whether you'll be living in the same flat in a year's time, that has inevitably um, implications for whether you belong to a, a faith community in that area, for example, or whether you're able to commit to volunteering in a particular place. Um, if you're always living under the shadow of your landlord kicking you out for whatever reason, then that kind of inevitably feels a little bit less secure in, in terms of place. Just touch on this one briefly, migration status and the kind of ensuing um, insecurity. Um, the, the start of this research or the kind of idea for it came before um, we'd seen refugees from Afghanistan coming two summers ago, certainly before Ukraine was, was, was even on the table. Um, and both of those in the course of the project just kind of amplified that, um, yeah, that insecurity that comes with migration status or with no recourse to public funds for some people, um, all of which are kind of inherently insecure states of being, I guess. And then the last um, highlighted form of insecurity that we saw was food insecurity. And this was a newer one, um, and I, I think quite interesting. So um, we saw people using this language for things that I think historically would have been called food poverty or um, or just poverty, actually. Um, and I wonder if that's because of the, the wide range of people that are affecting it now, that food insecurity feels maybe like a slightly less um, stigmatizing Kind of way of, of describing it than food poverty certainly this with this quote here for example was from a food bank volunteer um who used that phrase kind of organically it wasn't wasn't prompted and i think a similar interview kind of three or four years ago they might have said food poverty is a massive problem in our area um but i think that is just to kind of yeah demonstrates the the, uh, the kind of the scale of this and how many more people it's affecting than it, than it was and um, so I could talk all day about these different kind of manifestations of insecurity um, and just to kind of, yeah, to, to make the point again that all of them affect not only people's individual lives, um, but their ability to contribute and to belong to community, 
to volunteer, to belong to, to civil society in general. They also affect their, their reliance on those groups. And it's kind of a, it goes kind of against each other in that sense, or it's a, a paradox, if you like. But we saw how the story um, emerging from the research and kind of increasing over the course of 2022 wasn't just about individuals struggling. Um, all of these kind of aspects that I've highlighted are individual level consequences or individual level challenges. Um, but they add up to kind of the toll that the cost of living crisis was, was having on whole organisations to the point where we began to use this phrase a social recession um, and wondering if that might be something that we were also seeing alongside the economic um, recession. It was a phrase that was kind of coined in the aftermath of the 2008 crisis when volunteering dropped and financial giving dropped and the whole kind of social sector contracted along with the economy and um, slightly after the the economic crisis, a slightly delayed recession, I guess. Um, and I think it's too soon this time around to say if we're definitely going to experience this again. But uh, kind of the economic crisis following on from the pandemic certainly points in that direction. Just last week, um, Third Sector magazine had a headline about a wave of charity closures as the cost of living crisis bites. Um, so actually, again, even since November, this is something that really is, is having an impact. And it's because of a combination of factors, um, all of which feed into each other, all of which are kind of interconnected and related to the ways in which the cost of living crisis is affecting all of us. Um, and the first one is, is rising fuel costs, fairly self-evidently, I think that sense in which um, our own energy bills have gone up, but so have the cost of heating community buildings that we, that we often rely on. Um, and it's worth saying that the majority of these interviews, the majority of this research took place uh, before the government had announced anything at all in terms of its package of measures for uh, for energy bills. There have been measures that have been brought in that have helped um, both households and communities, and there's still a huge amount of work to be done to sustain that long term. Um, but the fear and the insecurity prior to that, certainly towards the end of last summer, early autumn, was really acute um, and really real. The stats that people were being quoted for their church energy bills and quite how much they'd go up by were absolutely astronomical with no sense of whether there would be um, any government measures for that. And actually, even when the government said they were bringing something in at a household level, they were slower um, to bring in measures for small businesses, for charities, for kind of community buildings. That did come, um, but it only came after a kind of groundswell of people saying pubs are also going to struggle to heat, so are churches, and that there needs to be something for that. Um, petrol costs as well. This was the first kind of indication we had of the impact um, that it was having on volunteers, even those who were comparatively well off or had been comparatively well off. For example, people who could previously quite easily absorb the cost of a tank of petrol to, to deliver the food bank, who were able to kind of use their own car, their own money for, for that. Um, and as the cost of petrol rose, along with the cost of everything else, um, people needing to consider their own budgets. Um, and as this is becoming, a, will become a bit of a recurring theme, I think, that it's a cost that was transferred to charities and churches that they just hadn't had to cover before, hadn't had to factor in before. And that's not to say that it's wrong to pay volunteers' expenses. It's not to say it's wrong to expect some sort of um, reimbursement if you fill up your tank of petrol every week to, to deliver for the church or whatever. But if it's a line in the budget that hadn't been there before, then suddenly that appearing at a time when not only was it not there before, but actually the cost of a tank of petrol is twice what it would have been last year, um, then it's inevitably quite hard. You can kind of see how these things all add up. And then the idea of kind of warm spaces came in, didn't it? That idea of churches and community buildings being warm. Um, and again, some of the interviews were before any kind of councils and denominational groups had offered funding for that. Um, and so there was a, a real insecurity about whether those would be able to go ahead. And this was really stark. You kind of look at the timeline of interviews that in sort of February, maybe March last year, people were saying, you know, we're quite concerned because in our congregation, um, we know that a lot of people will struggle to heat their homes come the winter, but it's fine because we'll be here, we'll be warm, we're going to open up and people can come here. Um, and then by kind of May or June, people were saying, and we're also terrified that we're not going to be able to heat. Um, and then again, a lot of kind of councils brought in some funding for that. And there were a lot of different kind of piecemeal initiatives to, to fund heating of warm spaces so that people have space to go. Um, and I think that's been a, a really good initiative this winter. It's not one that I'd want to see kind of becoming normalised or becoming relied on every winter. Um, but certainly that, you know, that does cost money. Yeah, this is just a selection of headlines um, 
very quick search that I did for headlines in the last six months um, to show the kind of scale of this, I guess, that it's not just churches, um, that kind of every aspect of society is, was worrying at one point about energy bills. And not all of these have kind of translated into actual closures. And we haven't seen kind of many, although some leisure centres closing, for example, but all of these were kind of expressing, I guess, the anxiety at the time. And that in itself um, makes life feel less secure, doesn't it? That in itself is a consequence. Um, and there were, you know, a lot of different kind of things going on in this. We saw, for example, football clubs bringing kickoff forward so that, you know, kicking off at lunchtime rather than in the afternoon so they didn't have to put the, the floodlights on. Uh, and all those kind of subtle ways in which life changed to adapt to the scale of this crisis. This is a graphic that one of my colleagues um, brilliantly did to demonstrate that if churches and community groups passed on the energy price hike, then, you know, things would quickly become unsustainable. You can see there that an activity that used to cost three pounds now costing 15 and that's not to suggest that there is any church in the country charging 15 pounds for a mums and tots group and um, i don't know of that but um, that's to say that if in the same way that a business passes on the heightened costs they did then it would quickly become uh, unaffordable and unsustainable and kind of counterintuitive i guess to, to the point of those spaces and why they run there's then obviously the impacts of inflation and um, we you know everyone's grocery bills has gone up there's an inevitable rise to the cost of anything relying on food. And we know quite how much of church um, relies on food, kind of how many of the projects that, that we see, whether they're food banks, community meals, even kind of toddler groups. So much of that is centered around food, not only for people who are hungry, but for people who want company, who want somewhere to eat a meal together. Um, and if grocery costs are up 16 percent, then, you know, inevitably the cost of running those meals is up 16 percent. Um, and it's often in the areas with the, the least kind of margin to shrink. So not only are there more people at food banks, donations aren't going as far. And um, the cost of basics particularly is really up. There was one stat that dry pasta is up 50% in a year. Um, and it's those kind of basics that are most relied on that food banks kind of rely on most and um, are kind of going up. Uh, Trust or Trust data out over the winter showed that they were having to buy, to, to buy, sorry, twice as much food um, as they normally would, kind of spend twice as much money on um, buying the basics because donations are down, demand is up, and at the same time as everything costs more. So that's all really feeding in quite acutely. Um, and it's really entangled as well. So we're starting to hear kind of anecdotal food, um, reports, sorry, of there being less food waste um, because supermarkets and kind of corporations are tightening their belt trying to re reduce loss because um, they're also feeling the kind of the cost of the economy. Um, but actually the ecosystem of food insecurity or food poverty in this country has become quite reliant on things like fair share. They started out as kind of environmental initiatives mainly, um, you know, not wanting to throw away food, not wanting to kind of see, you know, quite rightly, not wanting to see there be huge amounts of food waste from supermarkets. Um, but actually very quickly, they've, they've kind of gained a social purpose as well as an environmental one in that a lot of food banks and community meals and poverty, anti-poverty initiatives are really reliant on them. So as soon as there is Ironically, um, less food waste should be a good thing. <laughs> but actually, if, if a lot of charities are reliant on that, then it counterintuitively becomes quite a bad thing. Um, and then, you know, see, that's been compounded by the energy crisis and um, by the energy needed to cook both at home um, and in kind of church halls or wherever. We heard an example recently of um, a food bank that used to give out turkeys at Christmas, um, but this year had to cook them first so that families wouldn't have to have the the oven on for four hours to cook a turkey because they couldn't guarantee that they'd be able to do that um, and it's a brilliant gift to be able to give a family a cooked turkey at Christmas so they don't have to worry about any of that um, but it is also a transferred cost you know someone has to find the, the money to, to cook that turkey so this is um, yeah another flippant or quite trivial example of, of a graphic that a colleague of mine made um, it's a trivial example but I think it makes the point really clearly whether it's the biscuits donated to food bank or for refreshments on a Sunday morning or um, for a toddler group. We know how much of the kind of infrastructure of church relies on biscuits and um, refreshments like that. And if the cost of that is at 35 percent in the last year, you can start to kind of add that up. It's a huge um, figure. So there's also been kind of impact on volunteering and um, we've seen quite a few different kind of contrary trends, I guess, in volunteering in the last few years. There was the furlough effect. So that was where kind of a lot of younger and um, working age people who were on furlough used that time to volunteer. We saw kind of people who hadn't been previously volunteering doing so during the pandemic, particularly in the early days. 
um, and then a subsequent decline in that when they went back to work, um, compounded by the, the loss of existing volunteers. So people retiring from volunteering, people who were shielding or, or stereotypically slightly older, but not universally so, um, not all going back to projects that they had volunteered at before. And in, in many cases, quite quite rightly, you know, sensing the time was was right to step back, but that's not necessarily been um, replaced by kind of people coming coming forward. Um, and there's also, you know, kind of risk of burnout. If you think back to the start of the pandemic, when a lot of um, new initiatives were set up to, to serve the community, um, I don't think we ever thought we'd still be here three years later in this kind of level of acute economic need. Certainly when lockdown started, we were all kind of thinking, or at least I was, that it was maybe a couple of months, you know, maybe a kind of, certainly maybe the end of the year at the very the very least, certainly not that the kind of the economic need that those mutual aid groups, for example, were being set up to address in local communities because of lockdown um, would still be needed three years later. So there was a risk, I think, that people went too hard too soon in terms of um, giving, in terms of giving of time and volunteering. And also some funders, I think, did that as well. We've, we've, we've certainly kind of seen some evidence that funders who put in emergency or councils as well, emergency kind of COVID grants, then found that there wasn't really much left to do emergency cost of living grants year on year um, a few years later. There's also been an impact on financial giving. Um, there's a quote there from Gordon Brown, who wrote the foreword for our report, who talked quite powerfully about how compassion isn't running out, but cash is. Um, that sense of people still wanting to give, um, but there is just kind of less money, less kind of spare there to, to, to donate. Um, at the same time as well, as um, kind of how inflation is leading to a, a kind of devaluation of donations. You know, if, um, if you give... £10 and you've given £10 to a charity for, for years, it's a generous thing to do, it's not to knock that, but that £10 is literally worth less than it was last year and as someone put it recently, the only direct debit that hasn't gone up is the one I give to charity you know, we're told by every other kind of phone bill, Netflix all of those things that because of inflation your direct debit's gone up by 12% this month I've never been told that by a charity um, and I don't think that's you know necessarily to, I'm not suggesting in that that people are not generous um, or that we should knock people that are, are giving. Um, but there's, you know, there's there's that kind of sense in which the amount that we're giving, even if it feels like a, a good amount and is, um, literally isn't worth what it was. Um, and the same is true of kind of church collections as well. If you put a five pound note in every week, that's a really generous and symbolic thing to do. Um, but that's actually only worth kind of four pound 11 or something now. And, and you can't increase that. You can't put a, a six pound 16 note in the collection because that's the, the equivalent of the five pound that you put in last week. But so people continue kind of just because notes are there, right? Um, to, to do that's a nice round amount. Um, and then the loss of physical collections as well. We heard from one um, one kind of group that we interviewed that for, for some mosques particularly, although I think the same is true of churches, for a lot of mosques up to kind of 75 or 80% of their annual um, income comes from physical collections so they have a lot of people in their congregation who don't have direct debits to the, to the mosque the same is true of churches in a lot of areas that people are incredibly generous you know they, they kind of talk about how some people put in 50 pound a week into the collection in the mosque but they do it physically because it's part of the worship and part of kind of why they're there um, and when we had that whole time when physical collections couldn't happen then that was just lost um, and that's you know some of that transferred online quite a lot of it didn't and so there's that kind of pandemic effect lingering I guess in terms of uh, kind of congregational finances that um, are now further stretched having not been on a brilliant foot in some places to start with um, and so this all feeds into what we call the custard cream conundrum um, I actually think that kind of every report and paper would be improved if it made its kind of key point in terms of biscuits um, but that's an aside um, we kind of coined this to, to describe that phenomenon that I've highlighted throughout of those kind of small marginal losses, those small kind of costs that churches and charities have been picking up and um, that, that, that were never in the budgets before, um, but that are now kind of making things really difficult. Petrol money um, to deliver a food parcel being the kind of obvious one. Um, in the same way that people using their own cars and quietly just kind of donating the cost of that for, has sustained a lot of food delivery services for years, a lot of projects um, like toddler groups have been sustained by volunteers paying for refreshments themselves as well. Um, and the name stems not from kind of my reliance on uh, the office biscuit tin when I was writing this, 
Um, but from the example of one church where a, a core kind of named volunteer had really quietly donated the biscuits for a parent toddler group's refreshments every week for years, um, but faced with personal economic challenges, she, she couldn't anymore. And that's completely fine. She'd started to bring her kind of receipts to church and they'd suddenly realised that they, you know, the amount they'd saved or kind of inadvertently saved over the years was was huge. You know, we did some calculations um, and if every Anglican church in the country, and this is only one denomination, um, bought one packet of biscuits every week for a year, we're into six figures um, very quickly. And that's not, um, you know, that breaks down into like individual congregations. It's £100 a year or whatever, um, but it it adds up, right? And it's also not a cost that they've ever had to account for before. Um, so kind of if the cost of that has been, you know, absorbed by by the generosity of volunteers up till now, um, it is a problem when it, when it's not been something that they've budgeted for before. Um, and it's a recognition of the, the insecurity of the whole institution that it's reliant on um, one person buying the biscuits or that the whole kind of infrastructure of a community is dependent on one core volunteer. We know so many examples, and I'm sure you'll, you'll all recognise it, of projects that run because of one person. And if that person wasn't there anymore because of illness or because of what, whatever, um, then things very quickly fall apart. Um, and actually things that have been on the edge of the penny waterfall for years, um, it doesn't take much to kind of tip them off the edge. And then, oh my, there we go. Um, and then just lastly, um, social scarring was a kind of phenomenon that we talked about. So we talk about um, economic scarring as the kind of medium to long term uh, damage done to the economy by an economic crisis. So the, the, the way that it lasts, even you know, if, even if inflation went back to normal tomorrow, um, if we woke up tomorrow morning and this was all kind of figures were back where they were a year ago, there would be economic scarring. There would be kind of lasting damage to the economy in, in lots of different ways. Um, and I think the same is true of the social sector. So certainly after the last few years of pandemic coming on the back of austerity, coming on the back of or this economic crisis, coming on the back of both of those things, sorry, um, there's going to be kind of a long lasting impact on the social sector, even if, again, tomorrow morning, the, the economic damage was was gone. Um, so, yeah, just to end, this is a quote from uh, from someone that we interviewed who, who kind of capsulated that sense of how precarious, how insecure the whole kind of systems of the churches themselves can often be, um, that reliance on one small piece. Um, and that, I think, was quite a kind of key finding that it's, you know, compassion is not running out, but actually the kind of mechanisms by which we kind of administer it and the mechanisms by which we hold everything together are often less secure than we perhaps realise or the moment we maybe want to kind of recognise. Um, and then lastly, this, you know, another quote from Gordon Brown and Rowan Williams in, in the foreword talking about how the, the safety net is, is torn. And um, that's the kind of combined impact of all of the things that I've I've outlined, the different ways in which, yes, churches are still there, community groups are still there, um, reliably serving their communities, but it's not limitless. Um, and their kind of ability to, to do that um, isn't isn't there kind of, can't be guaranteed to be there forever. Um, and so I guess that's the kind of, yeah, that's where I'll land in, in the sense that it's, it is torn, it is clear, but we do, we hope that it's not torn um, beyond repair. And um, there is, there is hope in terms of kind of, yeah, putting, putting those things back together. Um, but I do think it's really important to, to recognise, I've written a whole report, but I think it's that important to recognise um, the, the ways in which these things are, are struggling and what needs to be done to, to address that. Thank you, Hannah. And um, questions are already beginning to uh, emerge um, from the chat. But please, if 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 uh, all of us have questions, please put them on the chat, and uh, we'll we'll um, uh, take uh, take as many as we can. So, Hannah, thank you for laying this out so clearly. Well, one question just to start with that I had. Um, did you have, has Theos looked at all at how this is playing out in other countries, whether there are um, lessons that the UK in its particular configuration of, of civil society could learn from other countries in a similar uh, context of, of, of economic prosperity? Are there things that other countries are doing that, that we should avoid? Do, do you have any views on that? Um, it's not something we've looked at kind of 
directly I would love to do a kind of comparative study mm. of this um mm. across Europe or whatever but actually doing it just in this country has been a, a nine month bit of work and quite a substantial one yeah. um so I think yes it's not it's not something we've looked at particularly um yeah but I guess you know some of the figures show that um where the the the, the the economic crisis that we're experiencing and the effects of it are more acute here than they are in um, even mm. kind of similarly similarly well off quote unquote countries in in other parts of Europe. So I guess the kind of the the pressures that are being put on civil society are are necessarily um, more acute as well. Um, but that's a kind of a yeah. hunch rather than anything based on um, any research, I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Kat uh, has has uh, a comment here that. Uh, uh it would be interesting to have your 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 view on uh cat wonders whether it would be better to refer to a cost of living scandal instead of a cost of living crisis a crisis being something that you know happens to you and a scandal is the result of poor and questionable decisions how how would you how would you think about that how would you respond to that comment I mean, I think in in short, it it is a scandal, right? <laughs> kind of, you, you only need to look at kind of any of the individual level stories of how this is um, affecting. I mean, the fact that a family can't afford to cook a turkey for Christmas dinner is in itself um, a scandal. Um, you, you know, kind of then the collective mm. impact of that and the collective kind of adding that all up. Any one of the the stories that that we heard in the course of the research is in itself scandalous. Um, so I think yes. Um, in a sense, I would want to want to call it that. I don't think it's hyperbolic to call it that by any stretch. Um, but I wonder if kind of in terms of getting political will to address something, um, crisis is a nicer thing to address, isn't it? So when we had the from from the perspective of this government, right? So um, when we had at the start of the pandemic um, emergency crisis response, um, we leapt in really quickly with the things that were um, done to address it. And we've heard from a number of different communities that they repurposed some of those mechanisms so quite a few people saying well we used to have the, the pandemic crisis group and now we've just renamed it to be the cost of living crisis group um, and in a sense that is a good thing because there are structures and mechanisms that weren't there four years ago and so in some ways we are better equipped I wouldn't want to yeah. overstate it but in some places better equipped to, to deal with the problems we're having now just because there's that collaboration um, and many of those structures are not they're not actually got any money in them They've got relationships in them that were built through the pandemic, interfaith relationships, into congregation relationships within a community. Um, and those were crisis response rather than scandal response, I think. Um, mm. And I think the kind of the yeah, it's all it's all kind of semantics, I guess, at the end of the day, isn't it? That kind of how we respond to a scandal feels slightly more campaigny. Um, and that's not a bad thing. How we respond to a crisis is to jump into action. Um and I'm not saying one of those is necessarily better than the other, um, but I think in terms mm. of provoking action from people, perhaps it does need to be a crisis, although it is at the same time absolutely a scandal. Yeah. Um, there's a question here from John Daniels. None of us obviously has a crystal ball, but would you agree that the shift of circumstances you've described actually is now the new normal? And if so, what will a chronic shortage of funding imply for the social fabric long term? Yeah, I think a lot of it is is being normalised. Um, whether it is long term the new normal, I think it remains to be seen. Um, obviously, we haven't got we haven't got a crystal ball, but I think there are some hmm. some conscious decisions that we can make that make it not be the new normal. So certainly around warm spaces. Um, I think it would be really dangerous if they became normalised to the extent that food banks are. So, you know, kind of a decade ago, food banks were few and far between. They were brilliant projects where they were needed. They were not kind of assumed to be there. They were not assumed to be part of our kind of social infrastructure. Um, and I think it's it's really important, particularly with warm spaces, that we recognise them as a very acute, very emergency response, but not something anyone wants to still be doing come next winter. Um, and so I think there is kind of, something that we can do around how we frame those things and how we kind of hammer home the fact that they really are extreme emergency things and not things we have any kind of intention of making normal um 
but yeah absolutely that second part is it's worrying in terms of what a kind of chronic shortage of funding might imply um in the sense that the last time we had this kind of normalized quote-unquote reliance on civil society it was called the big society and it was very deliberate um you know opinions differ on whether it was a good thing and whether it worked but it was quite a deliberate um attempt it wasn't kind of um, at a really kind of acute time of, of really dire need and crisis that everything stepped in it was a very you know very deliberate thing we're in that position now without any of um sorry without any of those things so yeah so I think it's really hard to say what it what it will imply for for the social fabric long term but I think certainly um I guess one thing to to be aware of in that is that need for government to to, to kind of recognize that to recognize that it's it's fine to want to rely on churches to rely on, on charities but there does come a point when some support is needed for that um, and as I said with the energy bills seeing they were quite slow to catch on to that we did catch on in the end but there's yet to be anything kind of put in place longer term so yeah but the easy answer is that I wish we did have a crystal ball um, mm. or even kind of something that you could you know magically make all of this go away but in the absence yeah. of one of those that's the answer yeah it, um there's an interesting question here from uh Catherine Fish do you think that the degree to which online connecting, as we're doing now, has changed social fabric and well-being? Um, you know, connecting online clearly has has um, benefits, particularly during the uh, lockdown. Um, but, however, when an individual is in increased need in relation to the cost of living, they don't so easily. Um, chat to one another online to admit a need or to realise that they're not alone. Do you, do you have any views on that? And and you know the, the, the how being online and being online so much has exacerbated this situation. Um, I think actually the opposite in the sense of kind of coming out of the pandemic and going back to in-person things and that is somewhere where the kind of the the warm spaces network has been really valuable um both in terms of kind of addressing need but also in providing social spaces so actually there is some there is an aspect of that of which it doesn't really matter whether you're going to one of those spaces because your home is cold and you want to warm up or whether you're there because you want to chat with someone um and i think to some extent although the kind of acute need of literally can't heat their homes have to go to somewhere warm is is terrible um that way when which that creates space that anyone can walk in um is really valuable in in encouraging people to to meet their to find ways of meeting their needs right so um hmm. it's a less intimidating thing intimidating thing to walk into a community cafe that happens to be warm happens to have a free cup of coffee that oh you might not have been able to afford otherwise oh and look while you're there you can pick up a food parcel um and play some dominoes with someone or whatever you know that's a, a much less intimidating thing than having to be referred to a food bank um or be kind of you know tick a few boxes on a form that, that recognize how how much you are in economic need um hmm. So I think actually that kind of return to kind of socialising and return to being in person has been really helpful. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there's been potentially an appetite to for that um, in a way that if we hadn't had kind of a couple of years without any of it, it might not have been there. I don't really have any kind of research on whether people mm -hmm. are kind of asking for these sort of things online as well or how that's affected it, but certainly kind of at least anecdotally, um, we've seen a, a, as many people coming to those warm spaces because of the company as we have because of the cold. Um, and that's mm. got to be kind of in some ways beneficial. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another question from David Shaw. Do you see any new forms of funding emerging for social projects, particularly out of greater online collaboration? Um, not, not off the top of my head that I can think of, no. I think play, people are getting more creative with funding um that might be crowdfunding that might be kind of sourcing smaller bits of funding um but I can't I can't think of any kind of new examples of that I'm afraid no mm. yeah yeah there's um a question here from Helen McCluskey um which is I I suppose something of a particular um uh sort of um, uh, importance, uh, well, it's important to all of us, but 
obviously we're green Christians, so there's there's a particular focus on issues of climate change and biodiversity loss. Um, do you have any views on how people can respond to those issues when they're in such a dire situation? Um, is, 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 yeah, is, is, is there anything that you would, is there anything coming out of your research that, that suggests people are kind of realizing that these things are connected, that economic security actually is in part in, in relation to a way of running our economy that's also leading us into serious issues of climate change and bio, biodiversity loss? Yeah, I think people are increasingly recognising that because it's very hard not to when you think of the kind of extremes of weather that we have experienced. You know, if you think of just 2022, we had the hottest day on record and inflation, the highest it's ever been. Um, and in, in one of those in, in isolation from each other would be a kind of once in a lifetime event. We had them both in the space of like three months last summer, didn't we? So mm. um, I think in that context and when those are the headlines, it's really hard to ignore the fact that they're interconnected. Um, I think there are ways in which this is is doing the reverse. So the point that I made about kind of food waste um, and the recognition that, it, you know, from a purely environmental perspective, the fact that supermarkets are throwing away and wasting less food is a really good point. That's what kind of food waste networks were set up to kind of rally for in the first place. Um, it is now a problem that we have, we've built an infrastructure that relies on that to, to such an extent that it is now a problem and that's not there. Um, so I think there's some longer term rethinking to do on kind of how we let. I mean, I guess that is kind of a, a normalization of something that should never have been a solution. It was never the kind of it should never have been a long term solution that people who couldn't afford food relied on the stuff that supermarkets were throwing away, because that's the kind of, you know, when you put it that kind of crudely, it's not it's not really nice, is it? Um, that has become incredibly normalized. There are kind of 10,000 charities in the country that rely on fair share um, and something like 25 percent of them say they'd have to stop their activities altogether if fair share didn't exist so if food, if supermarkets stopped altogether throwing away anything 25 percent of that 10,000 charities would have to stop everything they do and that's a huge kind of figure when you think of how normalized that that has become um so I think we do need to focus more long term on, on climate change I think there was kind of indications that people might be waking up to that but it is it is really hard in the middle of a crisis to think of, of anything else and i think that's probably the challenge isn't it mm -hmm. um there's a question here um about um warm spaces uh from from judith allenson um are, are warm spaces used a lot in 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 the inner cities you just observes that most of the warm spaces i've seen are used by a few people as a very useful social meeting place but i haven't seen any places where i live where people are there because it is the only warm space so a warm place so do you have any views on how how many people are using warm places spaces and yeah i haven't got any data mm. on it kind of hard data on it but there's certainly been a drive this year to to label mm. those as those places so to make it really clear that if you come into x church on a tuesday it will be warm um and then kind of a collaboration within a community where mm. making sure that there is at least one church or community center that is warm every day of the week um mm. and so people know that they can go there i guess part of it is that no one is checking on the door why people are there um mm. and so people might not ever say we're here because we can't have the heating on at home um, but it might be because they haven't had the heating on for weeks at home and just yeah. knowing that the church is there and it's warm um, and the social meeting kind of space for it is a is an extra benefit. Um, and the fact that they can get a cup of tea without kind of having to have the cost of boiling a kettle. Um, there are certainly people that we know of who are kind of calculating those things to the to the penny or to the fraction of a penny, how much it costs mm. to boil a kettle. Um, how much it costs to have a bath all of those kind of things and how long they can afford to have the heating on every day um so even mm. if it's not kind of a absolutely nothing at all or go to church kind of thing um you know that eases it a little bit that they might be able to have it on for a little bit longer in the evening there are there are certainly yeah um yes yeah, so and i've just seen kind of lynn's comment and i think there are certainly mm. plenty of, of of examples of people using the space instead of heating their own homes it doesn't necessarily mean that um 
they wouldn't have found a way to heat their home otherwise. Um, but actually, it's a, a relief. They've got more money to spend on groceries that week because they haven't had to find the heating or whatever. So, yeah. Um, yeah. But like I say, I don't I don't have the, the data on it, but I think there are maybe more than you're aware of, Judith. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a question here from um, uh, Rob Wakeling. I'm actually going to ask him to unmute. Uh, to kind of put this question himself. He, it's about globally, uh, global thinking uh, uh, as in relation to national thinking about economic mm -hmm. security. Rob, do you want to just expand on that question? And... Well, I suppose it's, uh, it's related to climate change as well. And that's already partly been addressed by the speaker. <laughs> so... Um, I just wanted to broaden that. I mean, we think a lot about the, the national issues and how it applies in our sort of economic framework, but we don't often apply the same issues on a global scale where the issues can be much more extreme. Mm. Yeah, I think, um, so the language of food insecurity is really interesting in relation to that. I touched on a little bit how it's it's being used increasingly in this country, but it as a kind of technical term, I guess, it traditionally is used more in kind of international development and it's insecurity kind of relating to people's um, ability to guarantee access to food. Um, and in, until kind of very, very recently, actually, that meant basically because there was none, because they're in parts of the world where due to crop failure or to famine or because of environmental reasons, there literally was no food. So it, it hasn't often been used to refer to um, inability to access food because it is there, but you can't afford it. That's the kind of change in definition we're seeing. And again, you know, you might have called that poverty a few years ago. Um, but that kind of, you know, inability to guarantee access to food that you can afford and also that you can afford to prepare um, is a is a kind of example. And so I guess I'd like to think that in that there is some sort of global solidarity um, in a kind of, you know, what what used to be kind of there is no food regardless if you is if you can afford it. Um, in kind of parts of the world where that was that was what insecurity or food insecurity referred to in the literature, um, the kind of that outcome of that is the same as if there is food that you can't afford. Um, the kind of mechanisms and the reasons behind it are radically different, um, but the insecurity and the inability to access good healthy food is is the same. Um, and so I think there is grounds for solidarity there, whether whether it kind of can be built or whether it is something that we're thinking about enough. Um, I don't know. Um, and I guess to go back to what I said in the climate change point, that without being too kind of navel gazy, um, it is really hard to focus on anything bigger than the kind of scale of the, the crisis you're in, especially if you break it down to an individual level. Then it's it's very difficult to kind of think about global concerns and to think about kind of making um, even kind of mildly environmentally friendly decisions when um, actually it's about deciding whether you can afford one tin of beans or two rather than whether you can afford the slightly less plastic packaging or whatever you know um, not to make it kind of too flippant an example but those are kind of the you know the decisions that people are making so um, I don't think it you know we should we should aspire to that sort of stuff we should strive for a much more global perspective on it um, but being pragmatic is really hard. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions uh, that um, you'd like to put to Hannah, and, and maybe just unmute and kind of uh, put up a hand? Um, and Kat, if you could just also survey the scene, see if there's anyone else who's... Could, could I um, ask a question? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've written it all out in detail, but I can't seem to send it. I've got a problem, but... What I was wanting to ask uh, was whether one of the real dilemmas is paying um, a realistic price for our food, because farmers are really struggling to provide food for us in this country with energy costs, labour costs, fertilisers, etc. And if we don't grow and pay more food, more for our food in this country, we're going to have to import food, which has increasingly in further insecurity problems with all that's going on in the world. And I wonder where this gets factored in, in terms of what we're talking about. Yeah, it's a real catch 22, isn't it? In the sense that yes, the solution is to pay more for our food, but we can't start with that solution when the problem is that we can't afford for our food in the first place. And actually you're, you're really right that kind of 
um, if we could get to the point where much more of our food was produced in the UK and, and all of the things that you just outlined because of the kind of the costs of fertilizer, of heating, of um, you know manpower, all of that sort of stuff. Um, if we got we got into a place where we we've got that in a in a good place, I guess. Um, it would require paying more. It would long term alleviate so many of the problems that we've had, particularly with kind of empty shelves, with kind of too much surplus food and they're not enough and all of that. Um, but it's really hard to start from that as a solution when, you know, it is a solution to a problem that is in the south, in itself, the problem of the solution, if that makes any sense at all. Um, so you're absolutely right. And also it's a, it's a very kind of counterintuitive and difficult way to get there. Thank you. Um, and someone's, uh, well, Kat's uh, commenting on uh, Marissa's parakeet that uh, is there or, or was there. Yes, true. I saw that, yeah. So uh, listening very carefully. Um, we're, we're, we're beginning to, uh, uh, I think, move towards the, the close of the session. Does anyone have any other questions they want to put to? Uh, yeah, Kat. Yeah, well, uh, hmm. thank you so much for a really interesting talk this evening, Hannah. One thing that I've noticed during the year with uh, over the past year with the um, increasing combination of crises, really, is that a number of campaigning groups and faith groups, which seemingly have disparate um, agendas, are finding the commonality, the links between climate and poverty and tax justice and so on and so forth and beginning to amplify one another's message um, and that the public narrative around how fair the system is and the ways in which it might be rigged against ordinary people um, that seems to be that seems to be coming more to the fore and that gives me a little hope actually because sometimes things have to get bad enough that that people say I can't bear this a minute longer um i don't know whether you've you've noticed any of that sort of uh, that's that building of alliances and noticing of allies yeah definitely i think it's happening i mean it's happening at a local level um as well as nationally um so there's a lot more kind of collaboration between different faith groups locally partly out of kind of that shared anger and that shared sense of things not being right but also just out of it's a lot easier to do things to do them together um even down to kind of you know really practical collaboration on warm spaces at the church with the most people and the most volunteers might also be the one with the oldest building um so it makes absolutely no sense for that to be the place that we heat if we're going to heat it and provide things for people so why don't the church that's got kind of fewer people but a brand new built or a newer building um we'll bring the people you bring the space um and that's happening out of necessity, but I'd like to think that will lead to kind of coalitions that last and collaborations that last far longer than this year, because once those relationships are in place, though, they're not going to kind of disappear when the crisis does. Um, God willing, one day the crisis will disappear or the crisis will be less, but those kind of relationships will will be there. And, that, you know, if, if there is any hope, it is that those relationships and the kind of the, the social and relational aspect of everything that's been built in, in this time will last um, and will have a longer legacy than you know some of the economic stuff um, and nationally as well you're absolutely right I think there have been some kind of more unlikely kind of bedfellows saying that the same the same thing on this that it, it isn't fair and I think you're absolutely right that it's because things have got to a point where you know it's it's very hard to pretend otherwise now isn't it and um, there was a time when it was at a level where kind of if you were really really engaged you knew that it was bad but you could quite easily turn a blind eye um, I, I think it's, it's much harder for anyone from any perspective to, to do that now and so inevitably there is greater or greater kind of agreement or kind of consensus that something needs to be done um, and again I hope that is a good thing or can be a good thing. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, do you want to finish um, uh, Hannah by just talking a bit about Theos and what it does and how people can support what it does? Yeah, oh, that's a nice opportunity to, to end with, isn't it? So we are um, a think tank. No one knows what think tank is. Um, we, you know, we do a lot of thinking, um, but we are a research organisation. We do research and commentary on kind of anything that is at the intersection of faith and society. So the sort of projects that I've outlined tonight, the research that, that, that I've done on kind of the, the way that faith groups are 
helping society and being affected by the economy. Um, but other reports on things like science and religion, a colleague of mine's recently done a, a project on how those things are perceived and how they relate to each other. Um, we've got ongoing work on kind of AI and religion, um, so artificial intelligence and how we relate to that as Christians and as religious people. Um, we basically kind of, in our research, bring a, a theological lens to any kind of issue um, in society or, or, or in the, of the day, I guess, um, and kind of, yeah, do research to examine that. And I often kind of how I explain what we do, I have one more minute, um, is kind of, we don't we do not do apologetics and we don't kind of actively try and convert people as it were. Um, I like to think we try and shift the dial from people thinking religion is wrong, uh, thinking it's stupid to thinking it's wrong. Um, and I think that's a subtle difference. So it kind of people, you can, dismiss um the religious perspective if you don't have a faith um but it's worth taking worth taking seriously even if you don't have a faith um and if you kind of dim it, dismiss it as stupid you're you're missing an entire kind of um sector of people's lives that is worth understanding and worth taking seriously even if you don't share the kind of philosophical basis to it um and again you know the, the work that we do i'd like to think is is intellectually robust and sound so you have to engage with it rather than kind of dismissing it as you know based on belief in fairies or any of the kind of tropes that people have of of faith um it is you know you can you can really argue with it on an intellectual basis and we're quite happy to do that we're quite happy for people to think we're wrong um but we're certainly not stupid to be christians great um and i recommend everyone to have a look at the Theos website. There's all sorts of fascinating reports there. And yeah, just as a little, a little plug, you can read the full um, Torn Safety Net report and plenty of other reports um, on the website. I'll put a little link in the chat to, um, that's to this report, but you can you know explore beyond that if you'd like. Brilliant. So thank you very much, Hannah, for the time you've spent with us. Oh, you're welcome. For you know, giving us the essence of your report and all the serious messages that, that it has. So you've left us a lot to think about, not necessarily very uplifting, but really, really important. So thank you again. And thanks for all of you for the good questions that you raised. Thank you. <laughs>